So I decided to do the Duck Tour in Windsor, which utilises an amphibious vehicle, and I believe it's the only tour of this type in the country currently. It takes you on both the road and then on the River Thames. If you go to their website, there are two tours. I chose to do the Mallard Tour, which is 50% road and 50% river. And personally, I think that's a perfect balance. My name is Liz, I will be your tour today, and this is the morning to So, the bus tour sets off hourly from outside the Theatre Royal on River Street in Windsor, and we immediately drive up River Street towards the High Street and pass the western curtain wall of Windsor Castle itself. The wall that we see on the left, the western curtain wall, was built by Henry III in about 1227 and is part of the oldest part of the castle that is still visible to this day. The first tower that we saw, the curfew tower or the clock tower, used to contain the dungeons for the castle and this green area in front of it was originally a ditch to prevent people accessing the wall itself. As we come up to the corner with Castle Street, where we will turn left, we see a statue of Queen Victoria. This was built in 1887 to celebrate her Golden Jubilee, but before that, there stood on this location the Town Gallows. As we turn left onto Castle Street, we get a view of the main gate into the castle, known as the Henry VIII Gate, constructed, strangely enough, by Henry VIII in 1510, and the two towers either side of the gate used to be used as prisons to hold his enemies. A lot of the castle as we see it today, both internally and externally, was constructed by George IV between about 1810 and 1820. As we turn right onto St Albans Street, we see the main entrance to Windsor Castle for visitors, paying visitors like you and me, which is housed in this building on the left. However, it is really not cheap to visit, with adult tickets costing £26.50 each during the week and rising, I think, to £28 at the weekend. The cost of this bus duck tour is also £26, but I feel less awkward about that as it's a small family-run business rather than a big state enterprise. On the left we have the Royal Mews, housing residences of people working in the castle, and also the stables housing the horses and the carriages of state business. As we continue along St Albans Street, you can see we still have the castle grounds on the left, and as we reach the end, we come to Park Street, once known as Pound Street, one of the most expensive residential streets in Windsor, with houses dating from the late 17th and early 18th centuries and almost unchanged to this day in their facade. We then turn across the High Street and down Sheet Street. Local legend has it that Sheet Street got its name from the Plague House or Pestilence House that used to be on this street itself. People who had the plague in 1650, 1660, used to be brought to the plague house and when they unfortunately died they were brought out and wrapped in white sheets before being buried. And it is possible that this is where this name came from, but it's also just as likely that the street was named after a sheet field, which was a very common term in the early 13 and 1400s for a common field. And they would have been fields dotted at either side of this street at the time. Although a lot older, this street really developed as a residential street in the early 19th century during the reign of George IV when the town expanded west of the castle. To the east, north and south of the castle we have only parkland but here you can see these fine regency buildings built in about or houses built in about 1820 and I don't know which one of these is owned by Anna Friel, the famous actress, but she does live in one of these houses backing onto the Long Walk. And here we get our first look at the Long Walk itself, stretching from the famous George IV facade, which we'll see in a minute, three miles down to Snow Hill, where we have a statue of George III, known as the Copper Horse, which was erected by his son, George IV. The Long Walk is lined with chestnut trees along its entire three mile length. But in ancient times, these used to be much larger elm trees, and as fantastic as it looks now, it would have been even more impressive in ancient times. The Long Walk itself was laid out originally by Charles II in about 1670. And the reason he did it was that at the time the French were building the Palace of Versailles and the English King Charles II was concerned that his international status and that of the United Kingdom or England at the time would be harmed. And therefore he used Windsor and the grounds and parkland of Windsor as a foil to Versailles itself to enhance and develop 
his international prestige. And as we cross the Long Walk, we look up towards the castle and the famous George IV facade and the Long Walk, which was lined with people not so long ago as the Queen's cortege took her body to its final resting place in St George's Chapel. We are now on the Albert Road, heading towards Old Windsor and Datchet. And the clue to the history of this area is in the name of this road, the Albert Road, because prior to 1850, this road did not exist. And it was the same with the next road we're going to go on to, the Windsor to Datchet Road. In 1850, Queen Victoria and her then husband, Prince Albert, decided that they wanted to create an area of private parkland. And they did this to the east and the south of the castle with the creation of the home park. The home park was an area which previously had been traversed by numerous public roads, but Victoria and Albert had these closed and rerouted along the Albert Road and the Windsor to Datchet Road that we're now going to travel along. This created for them a private area of parkland and farmland which exists to this day and remains close to the public ever since. As we come to the top of Albert Road we will turn left but should we turn right we would turn into Old Windsor which is a town that actually predates the town of Windsor and its castle. Old Windsor was the seat of the Saxon kings and Edward the Confessor in the early 11th century had a royal lodge in Old Windsor. Old Windsor had probably hosted a royal lodge since the 8th century but it was the establishment of the castle by William the Conqueror in about 1070 that moved the royal premises from Old Windsor to what became New Windsor. Indeed, Windsor was called New Windsor officially till I believe 1976 when it officially changed its name to Windsor. If we continued through Old Windsor, we would come to the famous town of Runnymede, where in 1215, King John and the Barons signed the world famous Magna Carta Treaty. Runnymede is also the site of the John F. Kennedy Memorial in the United Kingdom and the Air Force Memorial, which is located up on the hill overlooking the river and the Runnymede Plain. On the left, we now pass the Windsor Farm Shop, which is part of the Windsor Estate. The shop was opened in 2001 by the late Duke of Edinburgh and was created by converting Victorian potting sheds and constructing two new buildings, which became the farm shop and the coffee shop. The shop exists to sell locally sourced goods and those produced from the Royal Estates and the Great Park. As mentioned, the Windsor Datchet Road that we're now on was created by Queen Victoria in about 1850 and it crosses over the Thames on this bridge, again built in 1850 specifically for the creation of this road, allowing the home park to be closed off to the public. Unsurprisingly, it runs through the town of Datchet. Datchet is another small and ancient town located close to Windsor. In between New Windsor and Old Windsor, Datchet existed in at least 990 AD when it was mentioned in royal dispatches. It is located to the north of the Thames and was once only accessible from Windsor via ferry. I grew up in New Windsor and I went to school in Datchet, which is maybe why I'm so interested in this place. But the creation of this new road by Victoria dramatically changed the fortunes of the town by linking it directly with Windsor and also Eton at the time before the closure of the Windsor-Eton Bridge in 1970 to traffic and it's a very affluent town although it is very closely located to Heathrow and the M4 motorway so it does suffer from a bit of noise. Unlike Windsor, Datchet is used as a mooring for many boats along the River Thames and here we can see those boats with the home park created by Queen Victoria. The new road separated Datchet from the river and indeed some of the existing houses on the right from their gardens on the left and we can see this here. As we re-enter Windsor to the north of the castle along this road we can see the castle ranged up on the chalk cliff and below it St George's School. This school was established in 1348 and its sole purpose at the time was to provide choristers for the St George's Chapel and the castle something that it does to this day. Immediately behind us is Windsor Riverside Station and before it was a station it was an execution ground where the Tudors, in particular King Henry VIII, burnt religious martyrs at the stake. We now head out to the west of the town, past the river and the local parks where we're going to enter the river. Yes, there's no turning back now.
Now, the reality is that this becomes a very pleasant cruise along the River Thames back towards Windsor. But the fact is that until you get back towards Windsor, there isn't actually that much to see or do because you're looking at the riverbank, which on both sides is fields. We pass under the Windsor to Slough train line from the Royal Windsor station that Queen Victoria used to use to go to London. And we see just to the left of this, a little grassy area. Now, when I was a kid growing up here in the 70s and 80s, this was actually a little fun fair. And you used to walk along the towpath from Windsor to what was from memory, some swings and a little roundabout for kids, um, but long gone now. At this point on the river tour, the boat pauses and swings round to give us the best view of Windsor Castle itself. If we go closer to Windsor, the castle becomes obscured by the trees and the other buildings. And if we go further away, we go around a bend. So we get this fantastic iconic view of Windsor from this point on the tour. It's then another four or five minutes boat ride down the Thames, past the fields, until we get back into Windsor itself. It's at this point we get a fantastic view of Windsor and Eaton Bridge. The current bridge was built in 1822, but there has been a bridge on this site since at least 1171, and it was a toll bridge. But the particular bridge here was closed in 1970 to traffic. To the left of the river, we have Eaton, and the boathouses here of Eaton College, with some very smart apartments along the riverfront. And then to the right, we have the main town of Windsor. We can see here on the river the famous swans, which belong to the king, and the castle in the background, and the river cruisers that ply their trade in the summer. Windsor is a fantastic tourist destination, and this particular tour is really good. I personally, as I said, would recommend the 50-50, because I enjoy the road trip more than perhaps I do the actual river trip. Although the real feature of this amphibious vehicle, of course, is being able to do both the road and the river itself. At this point, we turn back on ourselves and head back down the river towards Maidenhead, where we're going to exit the river and come back into Windsor for the end of the tour. The railway bridge we see here is worth a mention. It was built and constructed between 1847 and 1848 by the great British engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who was responsible for the majority of the railways in southern England. The railway line it carries is a branch line from Slough, terminating at Royal Windsor Station, and used to solely be for the purpose, really, of carrying Queen Victoria down from London to Windsor. The brick arches we see carrying the railway either side of the bridge were added in the 1860s to replace wooden structures which had previously been there. And they are the longest continuous span of brick-built arches in the world. The railway and roads, of course, are raised here at this point because this is natural floodplain. And in the 19th and early 20th centuries, before the construction of the Jubilee River, this area often flooded. And in front of us now, we see the Queen Elizabeth Bridge, which was completed in 1966 with the purpose of carrying a bypass road from Windsor through to Slough. It's at this point we exit the river and once again change from being a boat to a bus. Having exited the Thames, we now travel back along the roads, along the same route that we had previously came, for the mile or so back into Windsor itself. Along past the river and back to Thames Street and the Theatre Royal itself where our tour began. This in all took about an hour and I have to say I found it really enjoyable and I would highly recommend it. Um, as I said, there are two options. You can spend half your time on the river and half your time on the roads, or as I did, 30% on the river and 70% on the roads. Personally, I find the roads more interesting. I think there's more to see. And I think a third of your time on the river is more than enough. But it's down to your personal preference. And either way, I think this is a fabulous way to spend an hour seeing Windsor. And I highly recommend it. I hope you've enjoyed my little tour of Windsor. I have got another video explaining in detail the history of the castle and the development of Windsor as a town. But I leave you now and hope that you enjoy Windsor when you visit in the future. Thank you.